Welcome. Uh, today we shall be learning about heat exchangers and their basics because these heat exchangers find wide use in the natural gas industries. So, this lecture pertains to heat exchangers in natural gas systems. In this lecture we shall be learning some fundamentals about heat exchangers and a few types of heat exchangers which are commonly used in the natural gas systems. First let us see what heat exchangers mean. They denote some facility in which two fluids at different temperatures exchange heat energy and due to this heat energy exchange what happens that we are able to heat up or cool down some fluid. Now, these fluids may be gas or liquid or both. Now, there are several applications of these heat exchangers in the natural gas industries like boiler, reboiler, condenser, preheater, economizer, intercooler and after coolers of compressors and many more. So, we find that these are used in the natural gas processing for like for dehydration, distillation etcetera, liquefaction of natural gas, regasification of LNG and as we take up the various steps in the natural gas processing, you will find that these heat, uh, these, uh, heat exchangers are coming in different forms in the various systems. Now, there are several materials with which these heat exchangers are constructed. Some of them are like titanium, stainless steel, then duplex stainless steel, then haste alloy and copper alloys. These are some of the common materials of construction for the heat exchangers and there are some of these alloys are like haste alloy, duplex stainless steel, these are the uh, some alloys and other than that we have also copper alloys. Now, depending on the temperature range we are working, these uh, materials of constructions are uh, chosen. Now, there are several uh, configurations of the flow. So, basically these configurations have been divided into three categories. One is parallel flow, another is counter current flow and another is cross flow. Now, what is parallel flow? It means that if we consider two fluids, fluid 1 and fluid 2 and let us assume that these are flowing uh, in a set of concentric pipes, inner pipe is concentrically placed within an outer pipe. So, that inside the inner pipe one fluid is flowing and in the annular region between the two pipes the other fluid is flowing. So, if these two fluids are flowing in the same direction we call it a parallel flow configuration. On the other hand if these two fluids are flowing in counter current or opposite direction then we have the counter current flow. Whereas, in the cross flow what we have that one fluid is flowing through the uh, pipe and another fluid is crisscrossing in, in perpendicular direction. So, this is what we call the cross flow. Now, we have several types of heat exchangers and all these heat exchangers are broadly classified into these three categories. One is pipe in pipe or double pipe, then shell and tube and compact heat exchanger. Now, let us see one by one again each of them. Now, what is pipe in pipe or double pipe? what it consists of two concentric pipes of different diameters. This is the easiest configuration one can think of where the two fluids are not coming in direct contact with each other, but are flowing through different pipes. So, one pipe is placed concentrically within the out outer pipe, concentrically means they have the same axis. So, these uh, concentric pipes are placed and one fluid flows through the inner pipe while the second fluid flows through the annular space between the two pipes. And as we can see that this is one maybe the primary fluid, primary fluid may be the process fluid and the secondary fluid is the utility fluid. That means, if the primary fluid has to be heated, then we need the secondary fluid which has a higher temperature than the primary fluid. And if I need to cool down the primary fluid, then we shall choose the secondary fluid with a temperature that is less than that of the primary fluid. So, here they are taking two different 
control volumes for their uh, their passage. So, that is how these pipe in pipe or double pipe heat exchangers are constructed. Now, this is a typical industrial construction of this pipe in pipe. Now, what we find here that uh, this inner pipe that is given by the dashed line is taking a U turn and it is looking like the hairpin used by us. So, this is called a hairpin construction. So, there is a return from here this tube is coming inner tube is coming and taking a U turn U tube and then it is going out whereas, the other outer tube is not taking the U turn they are they are like the other the fluid is flowing in the inner inner tube taking a U turn and the outer tube is just this fluid is flowing from the outer tube it is flowing like this and it is coming through this particular duct and flowing in this way and is going out. So, what we find in this particular uh, section these uh, these two fluids are going counter currents to each other whereas, in this section also we are finding that the two fluids are going counter currently to each other. So, in this is a counter current manner this is the flow is occurring in a double pipe heat exchanger. Now, the inner tube is as I said that inner tube is arranged in U tube or hairpin configuration and there could be single inner tube what we call simple heat exchanger and as can be multiple inner tubes. So, when we have multiple inner tubes we can see here in this thing that there are several inner tubes are placed and all of them are taking this U turn. So, this there are several of these hairpin exchangers and this is the outer tube. So, what is happening that from this side the from the outer tube one fluid which is given by the yellow arrow is flowing whereas, this is going through the U uh, these inner tubes whereas, the outer tube this red color one is coming and is going through the outer tube and coming out of this particular exit. So, there are two exits for the two fluids. Now, these kind of heat exchangers find applications for low flow rates for high temperature and for high pressure applications. Now, their advantages are that they are simple construction. So, they have low installation cost and they are easier to maintain that means, cleaning etcetera is easier and there we have a flexibility of operation in the sense that they can be easily added or removed from an existing battery of tubes or arranged in series and parallel combinations to accurate changes in the process conditions. So, these are the flexibility they offer in that we can whenever we want we can use several of these modules or we can take out some of these modules as per the requirement. Now, these are the typical dimensions of such kind of tubes we find that the inner diameter comes from 3 4 inch to about 6 inch and these are the outer diameters for the simple tube it is goes from 2 to 8 inch and for multiple tubes it can go to 3 to 16 inches. And uh, the heat transfer area is um, generally less than 1000 feet square if we need more than this heat transfer area then fin tubes are used fin means we put some kind of projections on the wall of the tubes to increase the area for heat transfer. So, these are called fins. So, these fins are used if we need higher than 1000 feet square of heat transfer area. Now, we have two types of flow configurations as we discussed that one is parallel flow or counter current flow in which the hot and cold fluids enter at the same end and move in the same direction another one is the counter or counter current flow that is the um, uh, hot and cold fluids enter at opposite ends and flow in the opposite directions. So, here as we said that for tube and tube this is a kind of configuration we have for the counter current and this for the co current flow of the two fluids. And the difference comes that in the uh, the, uh, the difference in the temperature at several locations. So, this y axis represents the uh, distance from one end and we find that for the hot in case of this hot fluid and cold fluid uh, we are finding that they are approaching their uh, temperatures 
in case they are in the co current flow and this is one is for the counter current flow in which we are finding that so this is for the counter current flow and this is for the co current so in this co current counter current we find that how the temperatures are varying for the two fluids so in the co current we find that this difference between the temperatures which is the driving force or heat transfer it keeps coming down whereas in case of counter current flow we are able to maintain more or less the same uh, uh, driving force for the heat transfer and uh, the driving force decides that how easy or how difficult it would be to um, maintain certain heat transfer rate and if the it becomes too less then what happens the area for a uh, for a given heat transfer rate the area of the heat exchanger has to be increased so this is a very important parameter to see to it that we are able to maintain the uh, good amount of driving force or that in this case the temperature difference between the two fluids so that is how we find that the co current and counter current flow dictate the driving force next we go to the and uh, the other type that the shell and tube type in this case we find that we have a bundle of tubes packed coaxially in a cylindrical shell and one fluid flows inside the tubes while the other fluid flows out throughout the shell now this is the typical configuration of a shell and tube heat exchanger we find that there are is a bundle of these inner tubes and this is the outer shell which is given by the white uh, white and this pink is showing the tube side so here we find that uh, some fluid is coming on the tube side so this is coming through the header this this is the header region and through the header this tube is getting uh, into several streams to the various tubes and then all these fluid from the various tubes are getting collected in the rear end header and they are going out whereas on the shell side we find the shell side the liquid is come some fluid is coming and then we are we are putting some baffles here baffles are nothing but some kind of resistance to the uh, to the flow of the fluids about which we shall learn a bit later and then this fluid is taking this kind of a flow path and before it goes out of this now we may have a fixed head or what we call tubes are permanently fixed inside the shell or we may have floating head where two bundles may be removed for ease of cleaning and replacement so this is here we find that we have the um, uh, fixed head configuration here this is the stationary head on the both the sides and here we have the baffles and tie dots etc tie dots etc uh, for the fixed head exchanger and here we have the floating head kind of thing that here we find that this is a floating head and these tubes are arranged the floating head so whenever we want to do some kind of maintenance or replacement we can simply take out this head from the shell and again after cleaning or replacement again we can put it back into the shell so these are the two configurations that is the floating head and the fixed head now these uh, designs of these kind of shell and tube heat exchangers are guided by tema that is tubular exchanger manufacturers association so these are some kind of standards fixed by this tema according to which the shell and tube heat exchangers are manufactured and generally for the petroleum and related processing applications uh, the class r type of the shell and tube heat exchangers are used now the choice of the configuration would depend on the type of fluid we are handling the pressure drop uh, the pressure drop that is because whenever there is a fluid flowing through the pipelines there will be pressure drop so whatever the uh, allowable pressure drop is uh, that will be that will decide the type of the heat exchanger and the pressure drop it translates into the cost of the compression so that is is very important for us then we have the heat transfer efficiency it dictates that how big will be the heat exchanger because that will decide the heat transfer area needed and then we have the ease of cleaning and some 
corrosion potential of the heat exchanger by the fluid. Now, these, um, these are typical dimensions of the shell and the tube. We find that shell OD can go up to 120 inch, whereas the tube OD varies between 1 fourth inch to 2 inch and in this case the tube thickness is given by the Birmingham wire gauge and earlier uh, we learnt about uh, schedule number, but in this kind of heat exchanger we talk in terms of BWG or Birmingham wire gauge for the thickness. Now, there are several arrangements of the tubes, how that we, all the tubes will be put in the in the bundle. So, first we have the square configuration in which we see that these if you join the centers of these this four tubes, we find that this is looking like a square. So, this is called a square arrangement and then we have rotated square in which we find the slight um, modification in this um, thing that this is with respect to the front view. So, this is looking like square, but this is on the front view it is looking like the a bit rotated. So, this is the rotated square thing and next one we have the um, equilateral triangle. So, these are this is the one uh, that these three tubes they are center to center if are joined then they will be coming like a equilateral triangle. So, we have different types of this tube arrangements and this will be decided based on the pressure drop based based on the heat transfer rate. And we define for this tube pitch that is the center to center distance between the tubes and then we have the uh, clearance as we see the pitch is here that between center to center is the pitch and the clearance is the minimum distance between the tubes that is this distance between the tubes with clearance and pitch is equal to the clearance plus the outer diameter. So, you can see that this particular distance pitch is equal to this clearance plus this plus this that these are two radii. So, 2 radii 2 r means the diameter. So, this is how we are getting pitch equal to clearance plus outer diameter. Now, we saw some baffles in the earlier figures. Now, here we see why we need baffles. Baffles are used to support the tube bundle against bending or vibration because the, in, they come at several lengths. So, for a very long length we need to hold them so that they do not bend or they do not vibrate. So, to restrict their vibration and bending we need the baffles and make the shell side fluid flow across the tube bundle so that we can get higher heat transfer because when the shell side tube we found that the shell side fluid was taking bends and by taking the several bends we are able to en enhance the rate of heat transfer. So, that is how also the baffles are helping uh, for better heat exchange. So, here we have one type of baffle that this segment this baffle what we see that this is the uh, front view of the baffles. So, this is kind of segment of a circle you can think of that here we have these small uh, these holes are nothing but they are accommodating the tubes and on these two sides we have some strips. These strips will be helping to uh, prevent any kind of channeling. So, we shall see those things. So, these are sealing strips are used, is these sealing strips are used to prevent channeling and these are the drilled holes through which the tubes are passing and these are the shell and this is how these baffles are placed inside the tube and this shell side fluid is taking these bends and thereby increasing the rate of heat transfer. Now, we have several types of these baffles. One is plate type that is it can be single segment, it may be double segment or it may be having triple segment. So, here we find this is, this is we have only single segment baffle. This baffle is on the lower side and this baffle is on this top side. And then we have double segment. Here we find that it is as if we have cut down into three pieces a full circle and these are the this is the middle one is this one and this one is this one and this one is this one. So, that is how we make the double segmental baffle and lastly we have triple segmental. In this we find that again we are making 5 pieces out of this and again we see that we have 1, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So, these 5 pieces are these 5 pieces here which have been placed in this tube to make this triple segmental baffle. Then we have the disc and donut type and orifice type and if I look at this figure we see that this is the disc and donut type of the 
um, or the tube arrangement and this is the orifice type. In the orifice type we find that there is some or a small hole within this thing. So, this is the orifice type orifice means small hole. So, after learning about this as I told the seizing strips are used to minimize channeling of the fluid between the outer row of the tubes and the shell. And we define baffle cut as the height of the cutout segment to the shell in a diameter. Now, we use several passes and what are passes? A pass denotes number of times tube side fluid travels the whole length of the shell or the shell side fluid travels the whole length of the tube. So, here we see that in this case the shell side is traveling this way once it is traveling. So, it is only one pass so it is one, only once it is uh, flowing all over the length of the tube. So, it is one pass whereas, in case of this tube side fluid what we find first it traverses the whole length of the shell fluid and then again it travels to another length. So, it is having uh, two passes. So, in this case we find we have one shell pass and one and two tube passes. Now, multi passes increase the contact time between the tube side and the shell side fluids thereby enhancing the rate of heat transfer. And they may be used for either or both the to the tube side and the shell side fluids. And how do we achieve them? That in case of tube side multiple passes, we give some u turns to the tubes, whereas in case of the shell side fluid, what we do? We partition with some longitudinal baffles, and as we see here, that we have made, made the multiple passes for the tube side by putting these u turns at the ends, whereas for the shell side we put this kind of a longitudinal barrier. So, that this fluid will come from shell side it will flow like this and again it will flow like this. So, that is how we are getting two passes for the shell side and four passes 1, 2, 3 and 4, four passes for the tube side fluid. And generally tube side passes can number up to 16 and we may have up to 6 number of shell side passes. Please mind it that even the passes are good for enhancing the heat transfer, but they also increase the pressure drop. So, we have to carefully choose the number of passes for a given application. Now, lastly we shall be talking about compact heat exchanger. In this case we have compact means they are the area density that is the heat transfer area per unit volume of the exchanger is large. So, in this case large means if we have any exchangers with more than 700 square meter per uh, cubic meter of the uh, specific surface area, then we call it a compact heat exchanger. And in this case we obtain large surface area by attaching closely spaced thin plate or corrugated fins to the walls separating the fluids. So, we have we can have various types of arrangements to provide um, heat transfer area between the two fluids. So, there is no hard and fast rule in to design this. So, I, let us see what happens that two fluids usually move in cross flow configuration and cross flow configuration may again be, in, be unmixed flow or mixed flow. And what will happens in unmixed flow that fluids flow through a particular inner fin spacing and prevent it from moving in the transverse direction and in mixed flow there is a transverse direction movement also. So, we can see from these figures that what we mean by unmixed that the cross flow is happening the tubes are coming like this. So, the a fluid is coming out of this tube side and 90 degree to it we have the another fluid going. So, this is going that is why it is cross flow and in this case what is happening this this movement of this particular fluid is restricted within these two plates. So, it is not able to move in a, in a transverse direction. So, we are calling it a unmixed flow whereas, in this case we are not putting any kind of partition there is again a cross flow, but there is a the transverse movement is allowed. So, this is a unmixed um, uh, it is a mixed flow for this um, this fluid and unmixed for the tube fluid. So, this is both fluids are unmixed in this case tube fluid is unmixed whereas, the other fluid is mixed. 
Now, we have several designs of this first let me, let me just show you that how it looks like that one is the uh, which is very common plate and frame heat exchanger uh, and here it, it is that we have these two fluids are going let us look at the red line first that we find that the red fluid is going like this and it is uh, going through coming down like this and is not collected it is flowing taking this channel and the other fluid is taking the other channel and they are going from the two sides means this heat exchange is happening between these two plates means these plates we have shown for our convenience we have just separated the flow but in actual actuality what happens these plates are there uh, joined with each other with some gasket so this is how we find these two fluids are exchanging the uh, energy between the uh, this through these plates so this is the uh, uh, arrangement for the plate and um, frame heat exchanger then we have plate fin heat exchanger in which what we are doing we are using some kind of fins over here so this is the plate fin we are using so here again the tubes are going and these tubes have some fins over there these are fins of the tube and these fins are providing some more surface area for the heat transfer or this kind of we can also have this kind of corrugations as uh, fins so these are corrugated uh, plates so these corrugations are also able to provide more surface area for the uh, heat transfer so this is one of one fluid is going like this and another fluid is going through the tubes so this way we are able to get high for surface area per unit volume and there are several other types of these compact heat exchangers and these are many designs are there and all these designs are being also innovated new designs are being innovated so there can be many types of this kind of compact heat exchangers so we have learned the basic heat exchangers used in the natural gas industries so these are some of the references which you can refer to for more detail about the heat exchangers thank you